Hey, how's it going? I'm Ron. I'm Zach. We're here on another episode of Influences. And uh, today we want to just say a quick word about Genesis with Peter Gabriel. Um, okay, so there's a few different phases of Genesis and different people like different ones and so to each their own but for us personally we prefer the era between 72 and 75 which are the three albums nurse uh, probably 71 actually nursery crime foxtrot and the lamb lies down on broadway Oh, I'm sorry, Selling England by the Pound and The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. Four albums. Um, the four albums that include the same lineup with Peter Gabriel on vocals and Phil Collins on drums. Um, now, there's other lineups. Peter, you know, subsequently, Peter Gabriel left the band to go solo, and Phil Collins stepped out from behind the drum kit to sing. And uh, Which... Phil Collins, you might remember the hit single, uh, and now the name escapes me. <laughs> well, the, uh, and prior to Nursery Crime, Genesis had a couple albums with a different drummer, but uh, it's these four albums that have kind of cemented their position in progressive rock history, and that's the sweet spot for us. Um, some of the early stuff, early to mid stuff they did, um, without Peter Gabriel. There's some good stuff there as well, and it's worth checking out, but we're going to focus on these four albums. Nursery Crime, Foxtrot, Selling in England by the Pound, and The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. I will say, I have not done as much research as I usually do for most of these episodes of Influences, um, but I can say that I do know a lot from them based off of the kind of scene that they were in, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that they had a lot of connections with Yes, uh, be it their genre or whatever. So um, I, uh, I do remember a funny story where on tour, I believe they would call Yes Maybe and they would call <laughs> Genesis some other biblical story, but I suppose it's not about the music. I also do, do remember them because they're bassist, which because I'm a bassist, I care plays a Rickenbacker, which is the same type of bass that many such as Getty Lee, <laughs> Paul McCartney, and uh, Chris Squire have played. Yeah, Mike Rutherford, he was, uh, he ended up on the alley. He started off as Genesis's bass player, but he also played double neck because he was playing a lot of um, accompaniment for some of the quieter uh, guitar pieces. Um, but he ended up being the guitar player and bass player on the subsequent, uh, when, when Genesis became ultimately a three-piece. Um, one of the things that uh, really kind of resonates with us in that regard is um, that we, uh, we do re kind of relate with that in, in our current incarnation of wide track whereas Zach and I are um, doing the writing and um, different tracking of guitars and bass and drums and vocals and then uh, Brian is coming in and doing his lead guitar parts but we're existing kind of in a similar way um, for efficiency's sake and until we feel like we have a lineup of uh, you know, with a drummer that's more than just a live drummer, we're able to uh, get a lot more done as, you know, in this form here. But uh, anyway, getting back to Genesis, um, Nursery Crime was the first album that I heard by Genesis uh, with Peter Gabriel. And um, the interesting thing about that era was um, their live shows. Peter Gabriel would dress up in costumes and it, and it was a bit unsettling and a bit freaky. Uh, he would come out dressed in a red dress and a fox's head or he would come out dressed in an old man's mask and uh, he would have these elaborate stories that he uh, conjured up himself to accompany 
the live performances or the albums. They would tell the story and then they would show the lyric and then the story would continue and then the next song's lyrics. And, and he was just uh, the most theatrical front man that I've ever seen. He was just, just amazing. Um, but uh, it eventually became a problem with the rest of the band. They, they would be like, dude, you can barely get a microphone up near that costume that you're wearing and your job is to sing. But uh, they also realized that he was the one that was responsible for getting them where they, where they were, um, in large part due to his theatrics. And Something to mention about that as well is that a lot of his theatrical elements can be seen in uh, other artists, most notably Maynard James Keenan from Tool, which he hasn't said anything officially, but if you'd ever seen some of the costumes that Peter Gabriel has been in, uh, you could possibly relate a connection to Maynard James Keenan of Tool, also being quite the theatrical frontman. Front being a late, lazy term, I suppose. Abs absolutely, I think it, it, I've never heard Maynard Keenan um, cite Peter Gabriel as an influence, but there's no question in my mind that he was was not influenced by by him. There, I mean, there, there's just too many similarities in terms of uh, just how wacky the costumes are and the similarities in, in terms of the, the looks and stuff. But uh, anyhow. Um, Nursery Crime was a really great album. It has opens up with the musical box, which is a, is a crazy story of um, it's it's a it's an English kind of a twisted English fable of a girl who's playing croquet and she knocks her brother's head off, and then she goes into his bedroom and discovers his treasured musical box and opens it. And uh, he appears with a boy's body and an old man's head, and it, it's just crazy. Yeah, but it's a beautiful song. <laughs> um, Foxtrot is the next album, and that has a great opener called Watcher of the Skies, where Peter Gabriel had just a really cool costume. You'll have to look that one up on YouTube. And it closes with... Uh, a progressive rock masterpiece that's about 20 or so minutes long called Supper's Ready. Um, Steve Harris of Iron Maiden even calls this his favorite song of all time. It is an epic tour de force of progressive rock proportions. Um, Magnum yeah, closes. Concerns all the war and Armageddon and, and just all kinds of lovely stuff. The next album in their catalog of that period is called Selling England by the Pound and it is arguably their best album uh, some people feel um, it opens up with the wonderful Dancing with the Moonlit Night first Genesis song that I uh, remember hearing and I uh, remember enjoying it thoroughly yeah that's it uh, is quite the so good you gotta to hear it for yourself. Yeah, don't, don't take it from us. That that album stretch. is worth a listen. I mean, it's got some really great stuff on it. Cinema Show. Um, uh, I know what I like in your wardrobe. That's kind of a cool uh, title. Firth of Fifth. Um, just a just a wonderful album. And that was kind of when they were at their peak as a live band. There's some nice concerts on YouTube of them during that period. Uh, Seventy three. Um, 1973-ish. Um, and so the final Peter Gabriel with Genesis album is one of my favorite albums in the world. It's called Sell, uh, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. And uh, it's a double album. And it's, uh, I just think it's a masterpiece. Um, it's a concept album. I'm not mistaken. It is. It's a concept album. Peter Gabriel came to the band and said, I want to write all the lyrics for this album and it kind of caused some strife in the band because up to that point some of the other guys were writing lyrics also but he was very adamant about it and had a really clear vision in his mind um, 
And incidentally, they recorded um, the album the same place Led Zeppelin recorded um, their fourth album, which is uh, at a place called Headley Grange. And so they would live in this mansion and they developed a lot of these songs through jamming and just assembling ideas from each of them. And there was a lot of difficulty making the album, I, I guess, but um, the finished product is just amazing. Um, I mean, uh, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, uh, In the Cage, The Light Dies Down on Broadway, um, Anyway is a great song. I mean, the, the, the album's just filled with great tunes. And it's a strange story. I won't even begin to. Uh, <laughs> I won't even begin to try and decipher it. But if you look the, at the liner notes, the story is written along with the lyrics in the liner notes, and um, it's definitely a trip. If you're into surrealism, um, if you're into surrealism, it's. It's definitely worth a ride. Um, so from that point, Peter Gabriel kind of said, you know what, I can't, we're getting too popular. I can't evolve as an artist um, with all these commercial pressures coming on the band. And so he went solo so that he could be more, have more artistic freedom. And in the meantime, Genesis continued to evolve towards a more commercial outlet and, and, and more commercial sound and image and so um, it, it's interesting to see that they they veered off and in the 80s right around 87 both bands achieved their greatest success and it was interesting that they their paths separated and then they kind of came together on the charts again Peter Gabriel with his album so and Genesis with their uh, Invisible Touch album. And the contrast couldn't be more stark. It was like Peter Gabriel continued to be a non-compromising artist and he achieved success. Genesis continued to be more and more commercial and they achieved success. Um, it's really a nice lesson in um, the, the contrasted paths towards success, um, not selling out or selling out. I, I'm, I'm not saying Genesis sold out. They, they very much intended to be more commercial um, for whatever reason. That's, that's not for me to say, but the point is, is Peter Gabriel's objective was to be as artistic as possible and let success come or not come, whereas Genesis said let's be more commercial and more accessible um, and then obviously Phil Collins achieved massive success in a, the air tonight yeah. that's in, what it in was in the air tonight yeah and that's a great song you know um, but one of the things that uh, that is worth mentioning that for people that criticize Phil Collins for being just total pop 80s is that his drumming on those four albums was amazing he was an amazing drummer um, he one of the best progressive rock drummers of all time and uh, being able to sing while you play that type of stuff is a uh, is no small feat yeah he it was, will surprise you yeah. trying to multitask musically is, is weird like try um, try doing a two on one hand and three on the other so anyway, um, listen to some of his drumming on like the Colony of the Slippermen. Um, we have a wide track song called Ghosts that I kind of lifted a little bit of the drum idea from that song um, and did it in my own thing, but um, very much influenced. Phil Collins was a left-handed drummer as well, which as am I. Um, so he was one that I really connected with at an early age, and I, and, uh, I can't say enough about his drumming. He uh, ended up playing in a kind of a fusion band during the, the uh, late 70s called Brand X, 
and that stuff is definitely worth checking out. Um, but uh, anyway, their song, just to, their song uh, "Nuclear Burn" is probably their most popular. It's good stuff. It's great. Good stuff. That's absolutely spectacular. It's a must listen. But uh, getting back to Genesis, um, if you're into, you know, conceptual bands like Yes, even bands like uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Asia, even. Yeah, there's there's a lot of good kind of progressive rock, epic proportion, uh, classical music based uh, progressive rock in that period of Genesis with Peter Gabriel and uh, his lyrics and frontman persona and costume changes really um, punctuate the, the, excellence. the excellence of that music. Yep. So, thumbs up for uh, Genesis and uh, Peter Gabriel and Phil Collins and the rest of the guys. And uh, thanks for watching. We got some uh, surprises coming your way. We're going to be changing formats here pretty soon. We're almost to our 50th episode, so we decided at our 50th episode, we're going to uh, make a podcast of this whole thing. Perhaps. Perhaps. But you'll have to see. We're, uh, we're not quite there yet, so. We will see. But uh, we do appreciate you uh, watching and letting us wax philosophically about our favorite bands and albums and stuff. And uh, we have our own new album out right now. We do. It's called Y Track 3. Um, you can check it out in the description. And we would love if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our newsletter which is also in the description. So thanks so much, and uh, really appreciate you letting us indulge our musical appreciations here. So, got a couple more here coming your way soon. In the meantime, keep on rocking.